were hurt, 32 of them are still in a serious condition. Tonight, the questions, was the crash caused by a signals failure? British Rail says it probably was. For more than 20 years. Tonight, British Rail has said it was probably caused by a signalling failure. The trains were the 614 from Poole in Dorset, which this morning started from Bournemouth because of problems on the local line, and the 718 from Basingstoke in Hampshire. Both were bound for central London. As they approached Clapham Junction in south London, both trains were travelling along the same line. But the Basingstoke train had stopped. The time was 12 minutes past eight. Moments later, the Poole train crashed into the rear of it at a speed of about 50 miles an hour. Then a third train coming out of London and fortunately almost empty, ploughed into the wreckage. The Transport Secretary Paul Channon called it a very major and tragic disaster. He told the House of Commons a public inquiry would be set up to investigate the cause. Tonight, the wreckage of the three trains is still blocking the lines. Some bodies are still believed to be inside. A number of people are still in hospital. 32 of them are in a serious condition. First tonight, a report from our correspondent, Michael Sullivan, who's been at the scene of the crash since early this morning. Soon after eight o'clock on a crisp, sunny Monday morning in midwinter, the packed commuter train from Bournemouth was rounding a gentle bend on the last few minutes of its journey into central London. With a bang which convinced people living close to the railway that a bomb had gone off, it smashed into the stationary train in front of it. The first coach of the moving train deflected onto the neighbouring track, hit a passing empty train. Eyewitnesses say there was an eerie silence as they scrambled onto the wreckage to try and help. Within minutes, they were joined by the first of scores of firemen and ambulance men. These pictures were taken by a London Fire Brigade cameraman as his colleagues fought to reach the injured. Many had died instantly in the crash. Many more were terribly injured and silent. Still more were trapped in their seats. Dazed and blood-stained, they sat calmly waiting for rescue and some were so badly shocked that they asked their rescuers what had happened. And as they waited, they were wrapped in blankets to keep out a dangerous winter chill. Can you keep moving along, please? For many hours, nobody knew how many still remained to be reached, dead or alive. The only tally was the number of injured reaching hospital and the numbers of the dead as their bodies were prized from the wreckage. The wreckage lay in a deep cutting far below the level of the surrounding roads and it was a slow, steep, slippery climb to the waiting ambulances above. It's the cramped conditions mainly. Um, there's a lot of wreckage around the bodies and it's taken a lot of, uh, a lot of time, a lot of manpower to free them. Uh, were you able to free some people yourself? Um, yes, but I'm afraid they weren't, uh, weren't alive. Were any of those people talking to you while they were still trapped there? Yes, I think that it's a great thing. It's a, it's a great human communication that when people are, are sick, ill and injured, um, that they do talk to you and uh, we talk to them because it gives them confidence to know that such people like the Fire Brigade and ourselves are there to help them. Very major and tragic disaster and I'd like to say how deeply sorry I am and to send my sympathy to the relatives of those who died and to those who have been injured. As far as we know at the moment, the most recent casualty figures are, I regret to say, that at least 30 people have lost their lives and some 112 have been injured. These figures will clearly increase, but I don't want to speculate on that at this stage. Just before the transport minister spoke, the last of the living had been cut from the wreckage. Some kept alive by the doctors who'd followed the firemen into the caverns of twisted steel. And the numbers of the known dead did rise slowly through the day and will continue to rise as the fight to prise apart the locked wreckage continues.
and among those who looked on were uninjured survivors of the crash and those who were passing on the road and were first on the scene. We were on a 77 bus going to work and we sort of parked the lights there and um, next minute we just heard this big bang. Looked around, this big like, cloud of dust came down and we saw like a carriage flying through the air that we, we must have landed between the two other trains. So the driver got off and we sort of flew down the stairs and I got off the bus, ran down over the fence and sort of clambered down to see what we could do. Yeah, we, we was helping people out and the yeah. woman was trapped with metal on her and, you know, it, oh, it was just, it was terrible. I, I mean, we're dead lucky to be alive. Dead lucky. Half an hour ago, the first of the crushed carriages was lifted by crane from the track to the roadway above. But the search for the dead is not yet over. Firemen estimate that it will go on until four o'clock tomorrow morning. And as you've come to us live here at the scene of the crash at Clapham in South London, the figures of the dead and injured do seem to have stabilised, and they are 36 people are known to have died, 32 are in hospital with very serious injuries, and 80 remain with minor injuries. The fire brigade, which is still at work here, says that it is reasonably satisfied that there is nobody left in the wreckage, but they're not absolutely certain about it. Now, back to the studio. Once the rescue services realised the scale of the crash, a special emergency plan was put into operation. Casualties were taken to four different hospitals. They made a public appeal for blood donors to come forward. Throughout the day, medical staff have been tending to the injured. Tonight, 32 people are in a serious condition. Ambulances shuttled between the scene of the crash and local hospitals all morning until all the casualties had been evacuated. Medical teams treated a grim range of injuries, shock, cuts, broken bones and limbs so badly damaged, amputation was unavoidable. As the casualties continued to arrive, doctors spoke of the long-term harm caused by crush injuries to lungs and to kidneys. This man, suffering severely, was lucky to have escaped alive. He was trapped in the train uh, between two other passengers who, who were dead. Uh, and he was pinioned down between his pelvis and his mid-calf uh, by metalwork. Extra staff were called into St George's in Tooting, where they worked frantically to admit the injured to hospital. Doctors said the emergency unit was fully staffed within a few minutes of news of the accident reaching them. More than 100 oh, casualties were treated at the St George's emergency unit, which was opened only a week ago. This man was in the front carriage of his train when the collision happened. Well, I was sort of half asleep and uh, suddenly there was a big bang and um, the next minute we were just being thrown all over the place. Um, and then people started screaming and uh, we just had to, I don't know, get up and help them get out of their situation. Medical staff who have worked all day with the injured could suffer the devastating effects of delayed shock. I think we may have some problems either later on today or tomorrow because it probably hasn't hit them yet and it, it's, and it usually affects the nurses and the doctors uh, as much as anyone else. But at the time, they all remained calm, they did their job as well as they, they were able. They've been fantastic. More than a thousand blood donors arrived at St George's after the transfusion service and the hospital appealed for fresh supplies. They queued for up to three hours, the line stretching around the hospital building. Tonight, doctors at St George's said that thanks to the prompt response of the public, no more emergency donations were necessary. All the medical and rescue services have been much praised. At the London Ambulance Centre, controllers at the height of the emergency coordinated a team of more than 100 ambulance men and women in 51 vehicles. Even hardened ambulance men uh, don't like uh, terrible accidents. Uh, however, uh, the job is there, they are fully trained, and once one accepts their training, uh, they, they would, of course, uh, jump into the uh, fray uh, extremely well. Tonight, those less seriously injured in the train crash have been allowed home. Emergency treatment continues for those who need it, and bereaved families and friends are mourning the loved ones they have lost. The Queen has expressed her sorrow at the scale of the tragedy. She said she was shocked and distressed and sent her deepest sympathy to the relatives of the dead. 
The Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Robert Runcie, said many will join me in praying for the injured and for the families of the victims. The Prime Minister has also expressed her sympathy. Such tragedies, she said, were always deeply distressing, especially when they occurred so close to Christmas. It brings home to us very much that families have lost some of their dearest people just at a time when it's coming up to Christmas. What has happened would be a tragedy for them anyway, at any time. It is even more poignant at Christmas and we just have to do everything we can to help and comfort them in their deep sorrow. The Transport Secretary Paul Channon has told the House of Commons that if the public inquiry found fault, the government would take action. Nothing would be hidden, he said. The inquiry is likely to concentrate on two things. The actions of those railmen who were in the train cabs and the signal boxes and, as British Rail have already indicated, on the signalling equipment itself. Our transport correspondent Christopher Wayne. While the rescue work was continuing, British Rail's accident investigators were already on the scene. In any crash, there are usually only four possible causes. Obstruction, equipment failure, human error or signal failure. At present, it's too early to rule out anything, but suspicion is focusing on the signals. Modern railway signals work on a fail-safe system, which theoretically makes it impossible for a train to run into the one ahead. The system has four lights. One green, two yellow, and a red. A green light means the line ahead is all clear and trains can go at full speed. Two yellow lights means slow down because the signal ahead is at caution. One yellow means caution, be ready to stop because the signal ahead is red. And red means stop, either wait for the light to change or call the signal box. A train on a section of line automatically sets the signal behind it to red. It won't change back to yellow until the train has continued a quarter of a mile beyond the next signal. As the train passes a signal, it sounds a warning in the driver's cab. For a green light, there's a bell, but for yellows and reds, a horn sounds. The driver must acknowledge this by pressing a button. Otherwise, the brakes will automatically stop the train. The trouble is that during rush hours, almost all signals are double yellows. So the horn sounds every few seconds. The drivers, instead of getting green signals, are continually driving on yellow signals. They are continually getting the automatic warning in the cab and cancelling that signal by signal. There is an inherent danger there, which has been recognised, but uh, the driver's cancellation will become automatic. This morning, the front train had apparently stopped at a red light and passengers saw the driver talking on the trackside phone a few seconds before the second train ploughed into the back. The key questions for the investigators are, was there a red light at the point where the first train stopped? And if so, what colour were the signals further down the line? This disaster has focused attention on the severe overcrowding of commuter trains. It's estimated there were over a thousand people on board the two which collided this morning. And without the protection of seats, injuries were bound to be severe. But critics also blame the lack of investment, which has resulted in well over 2,000 trains passing daily through Clapham Junction and its ageing signalling system. An awful lot of new stock is actually being purchased at the present time, though there's an awful lot of old stock there. But it really is as equally as important whether the amounts of resources are going into replacing the 50-year-old signalling equipment that we have in a lot of our railway system. Well, we have standards for overcrowding on trains. The most important thing, it seems to me, is to try and understand what the cause of the accident has been. That is the principal thing. However many people are on a train, what you want to do is to avoid the accident occurring in the first place. That will be the intention of the public inquiry to establish the cause of the accident. The system involved in this crash is being modernised. As a result, there are numerous temporary signals in place. And according to one report, work on signalling equipment was being carried out on this section of the line yesterday. That may hold a clue to what happened this morning. Christopher Wayne. Well, earlier this evening I asked the Transport Secretary Paul Channon about public concern over travelling by train. What assurances could he give that the rail system was as safe as it could be? I can never say that. 
All I can say is that we should do everything within our power to provide British Rail and the Underground with the investment money so that they can invest in improving safety and quality of service on commuter lines into London. Uh, and as I say, a record amount of money is being provided and both the rail operators know very, very well indeed that safety is the most important thing they have to deal with. Well, we're joined now from the scene of the crash by Gordon Pettit, the general manager of British Rail's southern region. Mr Pettit, the British Railways Board has said tonight that a preliminary investigation indicates that a technical fault in connection with re-signalling caused the crash. What more can you tell us about that? Very little more than that. Uh, that is the results of our preliminary findings. Uh, there are more investigations obviously going on at the present time, uh, ready for when the inquiry um, opens on Wednesday. But it is, I think, correct that some of the signalling equipment at Clapham Junction is more than 50 years old, and that equipment is in the process of being replaced. Yes, I don't think the age of the, um, the old equipment is a factor, as far as I can see but we will have to wait until the inquiry to confirm that. Are you saying that the fact that there is equipment of this age is irrelevant to what has happened today? I believe that it may be irrelevant, but we shall have to wait until the inquiry um, has concluded. As I think you've uh, mentioned already, our statement does indicate our preliminary inquiries um, show that a technical fault may have arisen uh, during the uh, re-signalling, and we shall have to wait and see whether uh, that, informa that preliminary information is confirmed in our detailed findings uh, over the next few days. Mr Pettit, is there much 50-year-old equipment on British Rail now? Well, certainly in the busy uh, parts of the uh, commuter area of Network South East and Southern Region, of course not, no. Are you satisfied that enough is being done to ensure that the standards of safety on British Rail, and particularly with the millions of people travelling in by train to London every day, that those standards of safety are as high as they could be? I am really satisfied because uh, safety has never been prejudiced in British Rail um, in terms of uh, money or any other cause. I can honestly say uh, to everyone that safety has been of uh, paramount importance um, in this railway business uh, going back into the last century and it's the priority certainly has not changed in the last few months. Gordon Pettit after what I'm sure has been a very somber and trying day for you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank for you joining very us. much. Thank you. And the Metropolitan Police have set up a special telephone number if you want information about this morning's casualties. The number is 01 if you're calling from outside London 834 7777. So let me just repeat that number. It is 01834 7777. And later in the programme, the rest of today's news and the latest from Armenia. The aid is continuing to pour...